in Bob's talk about um, the, the whole question of uh, pharmaceuticals and so on. And we wanted a panel that would follow up with uh, some of that same kind of conversation because clearly I was left with the same question of, well, what do we do? I mean, we still know people are suffering and people have uh, situations that they're dealing with. And if we're surrounded by an entire, or not an entire, but by a, a medical community and a narrative that talks about identifying the disease and treating the disease, you know, how do you turn a world around? And it's probably like everything else, you do it one person at a time. I used to be at Working Mother Magazine, and we used to say we are changing the world one diaper at a time. <laughs> but in any event, um, and so our panel now, uh, and the title of it, and I don't have it right in front of me, but it's Coming Out the Other Side Recovered. And we have three ladies with us who are going to share their stories about their own dealing with issues related to mental illness and what their lives were like and where they are now and how they handled it and how they continue to handle it. And we have with us Kathy Penny, who uh, is the subject of a book called Dante's Cure that you all may want to read, written by her psychiatrist, Dan Dorman. And Kathy drove in here from California to be with us today, so we are really delighted. Thank you, Kathy. And Lori Morrison. Lori lives here in Sedona. She's been here a number, a few years. And she's a very active part of the coalition. She's, uh, she is the director, she's vice president and director of the education committee and is responsible for a lot of what's going on here today. So Lori's gonna share with us her story. And Laura Delano, I believe you are, you're from Boston, uh, but she's down in Phoenix for a conference. And she is a strong supporter of Bob Whitaker. And you'll hear more about her story uh, related to that. And she drove up here this morning to be with us. So we are really delighted. Thank you. Now, did you decide who was going first? Okay, Laura's gonna go first, and I'll let them share their backgrounds, their stories. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. I'm, I'm just going to set up my timer here so I can track myself. Um, so yeah, if you can't hear me, just let me know. Raise your hand. Um, yeah, it's an honor to be here. I'm really grateful to be able to share time with you today and uh, to, to talk a bit about the experiences that I've had uh, growing up in the mental health system and becoming an ex-mental patient. Um, so I'm gonna take the next 15 to 20 minutes to tell you a bit about how I got into the system, what happened to me while I was in it, how, I, how and why I decided to get out of it, and what my life looks like now that I'm an ex mental patient. Um, and I should say that over the course of my career as a mental patient, I acquired a long list of labels, uh, bipolar, borderline, alcoholic, anxiety disordered, eating disordered, duly diagnosed, depressed. Um, and today, the only words I really identify with are human beings. So I've left behind the entire framework for, the entire linguistic framework for how I make sense of myself, and, um, and that's a big part of my story. So, yeah, so how I got in. Well, I grew up in um, an affluent town as a, a white, upper middle class kid, afforded a lot of privilege, and that's a big part of my story, and I try to always name that because it, it played a significant part in why I went into the system, but it also played an absolutely essential part in how I got out. Um, I was a really highly overachieving kid. Um, I played sports, got good grades, was a student government leader. Uh, I, on the surface, I kind of had it all together. And uh, when I was 13, 14, I began to um, call into question a lot about who I was, and it happened quite intensely and quite acutely. I had an experience in front of the bathroom mirror one night where I, I was just looking into my eyes, brushing my teeth, and I was looking deeper and deeper into myself in the mirror, and suddenly I saw a stranger looking back at me, and I just stared at this girl for I don't know how long, 
and I had no idea who she was, and I had no idea why she was looking at me, and it terrified me, and I didn't understand what the experience meant, and it, it stayed with me, and, and being the kid that I was, young, not really exposed to any frameworks to make sense of this kind of experience, I concluded that it must mean that I didn't I wasn't a real person, I didn't have a real self, I was fake, I was a performer, I was an actor, kind of playing this part of this put-together kid, but really underneath, I, I was a fraud. And that stayed with me through that year and the next year to follow, and I just held that in because I didn't have space, I didn't see any spaces in which I could talk about that, and I was ashamed and afraid and confused. And um, as one might expect, holding that in is a big thing, and I eventually began to explode. It was a lot to hold in, and, and I kept it together outside of our home, but behind the closed doors of our home, I began to act out and to scream and curse and hit and yell and slam doors and talk about death and cut myself and hate the world. And my parents understandably didn't know what to do. They were confused and afraid and scared, and they didn't see any other real options for me um, either the the one kind of glistening beacon of hope that they saw as loving American parents was the mental health system and so there I went and I could talk for hours for hours about what happened to me in there and time goes fast so I'll cruise through it rather quickly and I just realized my stopwatch never actually started um, so, <laughs> So um, yeah, I, w I was plopped down in front, of a psych in front of a psychiatrist at the age of 14 um, and in a matter of 45 minutes was told that my anger and irritability was a sign of mania and my despair and thoughts of death a sign of depression and that I had juvenile bipolar disorder. And I left with a prescription for Depakote and Prozac. And this was in 1997, which was right in the ballpark of the real push for uh, this new diagnosis to, to make it out there, to get into the journals, to you know get these drugs into the hands of child psychiatrists, and and there I was, right, perfect timing to be labeled bipolar, and um, the the message that I took from that, and, and I think this is really a core part of the medical model and why I think it can serve to be uh, so disempowering is that you know I I, I understood this label as a. It, a Basically, I'm broken, I'm fundamentally defective, I am the problem, it has nothing to do with, with what's going on around me, I just have faulty brain chemistry, and, and essentially, I'm a like defective human being. And, and that pissed the hell out of me. I, I was absolutely um, outraged that this strange woman who had no idea who I was, who had no idea about my family, about my upbringing, about anything, was sitting here telling me that my brain was broken. And Luckily, as I look back now and I'm grateful for that fire in me, I was quite resistant to what she told me and I did my best to hide the pills to avoid taking them whenever I could and I was able to cruise through the next several years without really accepting anything that she told me. But that seed of brokenness had been planted in me and no matter how much I tried to deny it, I, I, I couldn't forget what I'd been told about myself. And, by the time I got to college, um, I, I went to Harvard, and, and of course, when you hear that name, you think, oh, she's someone who made it. And I, I had bought into that story for myself as well. If I just excel in school, if I am top of my class, if I go to the top school in the country, I'm going to be okay. I'm gonna, this, this emptiness and, and fraudulence I feel inside of me will go away if I can just make it to this place that everyone tells me I need to make it to. And I made it there, and, and nothing got better. Um, I felt the same emptiness, the same disorientation, the same loss of, of self that I'd felt through high school. And, th and though I rejected psychiatry and the mental health system through those years, it, it all came flooding back um, as it really struck me that something must really be wrong with me because there are no reasons on the surface for me to want to die, for me to, to be lost and despairing for me to be staying up until three in the morning thinking about the meaning of life and space and time and language and what's real and what isn't, there must be something wrong with me. And, and that was the turning point for me at which I truly became a mental patient. I was despairing, I was afraid, I was overwhelmed by pain and I didn't know what to do with that anymore. And I ran back into the arms of the mental health system at that point. And, and I think that's a key, another key point is that I, 
when you're in pain and you're, you've been in it for a long time and you've seen no way out and you've tried as best you can and it doesn't seem to be changing, it just seems to be getting worse, to me there's nothing more hopeful and inspiring and, and invigorating and encouraging than being told it's not your fault. You know, this is not about you being weak or lazy or bad, this is about you being sick. And we have a medicine or medicines that are going to help you feel better. I mean, I was just overwhelmed by a sense of relief and joy and hopefulness. And that stayed with me for a while. That was really, I think, what drove me to go deeper and deeper into the mental health system was this underlying faith in the messages that they were telling me about my suffering and pain and, and how, I could, how they could make it better. Um, and so that faith in the system progressively grew over the next decade, really. Um, and at the same time, any faith that I'd ever had in myself diminished because when you're overwhelmed by pain and you want it to be gone and, and here are all these glistening promises of pill bottles and doctors with special modalities of healing, um, it's quite easy to give up your own power and your own agency and your own sense of responsibility, especially when you're a young person and you haven't yet had a chance to form your own sense of self, as I hadn't because I'd been I'd lost that self, and then I'd been labeled broken. And um, as Bob, of course, laid out so clearly, uh, what happens when you accept the conventional standard of care in the mental health system isn't always um, glistening, happy, healthy, smiling faces. One drug became two, became three, became four. My faith in the system kept growing somehow as my life began to fall more and more apart. And I somehow managed to graduate college, but by the time I was in my mid-twenties, I had no friends, I had gained 50 pounds, I had lost my creativity, I had no sense of meaning or purpose in my life. Um, I had acquired, I had to kill myself. I accepted that I, even though I went to Harvard and maybe had these, you know, glowing, this glowing potential in the past, now all I was was seriously mentally ill and I'd have to just accept the life that would come with that. And, and I really believed in this story deeply. Um, and of course, I'm skipping over many, many things here because I want to get to the, uh, the light part of my story. Um, but I, sh I do think it's important to say that my faith in the conventional mental health system, my faith in the drugs, my faith in the labels brought me to the point at which I was diagnosed a, a treatment resistant patients. You know, I, I was literally like seeing the top doctors at, at Harvard Medical School, going to the top private psychiatric institutions, taking the newest sophisticated medications, and nothing was helping. Nothing was helping me feel happy, feel peace of, peace of mind, feel purpose, feel anything. I was just falling more and more apart, and that brought me to the point at which death became the only logical solution to my treatment-resistant, mentally ill life. And, and, su and suicide really did play a big part of my story because I saw it as my only way out eventually. Um, the system had taught me, you have no power over yourself, your brain is broken, there's nothing you can do about it but manage your symptoms with these pills and treatments and check yourself into the hospital when you need to and that's going to be your life. What kind of life is that to, to want to live? And I, I to this day believe that my, cho my choice to kill myself was the most healthy, logical, conclusion I could have drawn, given what my life had become. But clearly, I didn't die. <laughs> At the time, I was just absolutely devastated that I, I failed at killing myself. Um, and now I, of course, look back and I'm tremendously grateful that my body somehow fought through my, my suicide. Um, however, that wasn't the turning point for me. I, I struggled on for two more years, basically just waiting to, to get to the point where I would finally kill myself once and for all. Which leads me to 2010, the year I uh, escaped. <laughs> um, so 2010, I'm 27, I'm on five drugs, Lamictal, Lithium, Abilify, Effexor, and Ativan, uh, which is considered the, a sophisticated medication regimen, I should say. Um, I'm attending an outpatient hospital, uh, an outpatient part, uh, an outpatient hospital program for people labeled borderline, which was <laughs> I have to say my favorite label. I just, it blows my mind. That, yeah, that label, man. Um, and my days consisted of sitting in 
groups where we sat around and talked about how borderline we were and uh, with white men basically telling us, you know, telling us about ourselves. Um, and a series of small, seemingly small events began to happen that I now see and have laid the seeds for my big aha moment that was going to come a few months later. First, um, I, was, I was thinking about killing myself. I was totally, what's the point in this life? Somehow my doctor caught wind of this and decided that I wasn't able, I wasn't going to be allowed to go home. Um, I was actually cool with going into the hospital. I, I was, a, I loved being hospitalized. I, it was the only place I felt safe for myself. But I wanted to go home first and get my belongings. Because if any of you have been locked up on a psych ward, like, there's nothing worse than being on this, like, stiff plastic mattress with strangers where your, like, shoelaces and sweatshirt tie are pulled out. You don't know anyone around you and you don't have anything of yours to hold on to. So I just wanted to go home. Obviously that wasn't going to happen. Um, two big sterling, Two big burly security guards get involved and I'm gently, kindly escorted over to the psych ward. That was my first encounter with force because I've been this compliant patient until that point. And holy cow, did that piss the effing hell out of me. <laughs> I, it was the, I'm so grateful for that moment now because it forced me to come face to face with the power that the system had over my life. I had no right over my body, over my right to fresh air. Um, because I was thinking about death, I now was going to be robbed of any liberties. This, this stayed with me. And I had a couple of other small events involving forced medication um, for what was then, I then was th thought, thought of as alcoholism. I had a, an encounter with, close encounter with police. These, these events were forcing me to come closer and closer to the reality of what my life had become, that I had no power over myself, no agency, they owned me basically. And I wasn't like consciously thinking about this all the time because my identity was completely wrapped up in being bipolar and being mentally ill. But I was, I was unsettled and it would creep in at moments. And then eventually I, I found myself in a bookstore and happened upon the book that you just heard the author of speak, um, Anatomy of an Epidemic. And I don't know how and why I really, I, I got it. I mean, actually I do know, it was the cover. The cover, which if you recall, it has a, head, a phrenology head with different psychiatric drug names on it. I've been on basically every single one of those drugs, except for the stimulants, because somehow I'd escaped an ADHD label. <laughs> and I was like, what is this book? I've been on like all these drugs. I didn't know what it was about. I didn't know anything about Robert Whitaker, but I just somehow knew I had to read it. And it, I somehow actually read it, because by that point, when you're on five drugs, it's pretty hard to read uh, a sentence, let alone a whole book that involves a lot of dense scientific data. But like somehow I read it, I don't know how, and that was really my aha moment. It was quite a traumatic experience, actually, because as I'm reading the page after page of the narrative of long-term use of psychiatric drugs, everything is just falling into place in stark clarity. You know, my, my life just falling progressively more apart. My physical health, my ability to maintain relationships, my ability to work, my ability to have any kind of creativity, passion, joy, meaning, purpose. It had been gone for so many years and I've been buying into this idea that it was because of my illness. And suddenly I have this new narrative. What if it's your treatment? What if it's the treatment? And it blew my mind. And that was really the turning point for me. Um, that was six years ago almost, and a lot's happened since then. And, and I would say that uh, really, if I was gonna sum up what these past six years have been, I wouldn't call it recovery in the conventional sense of like mental health recovery. I'd really call it reclamation. I've slowly but surely reclaimed my life, reclaimed my body from the drugs, my identity from the labels, um, my sense of agency and responsibility as a human being, which I'd lost over all those years of thinking of myself as sick and broken and not able to take care of myself, not able to manage my life. Um, it's been the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, getting, getting off of those drugs um, and, and unlearning that mentally ill identity has been absolutely excruciatingly painful. Um, and, and I would love in the question and answer period to talk with folks about withdrawal. And I imagine that withdrawal will be a part of Lori's story and Kathy's story too, potentially, um, because it's such a big topic. Getting off of psychiatric drugs is incredibly dangerous 
and difficult and complicated. And so it's really worth hours of discussion. Um, but as I, as I came off of the drugs and slowly began to reconnect with my body, with my sexuality, with my cognitive function, um, with my energy, it, it was, it's, it's been a profoundly overwhelming experience. And, and it's helped me see just, like that's the tragedy of it, is that I had no way of knowing what it, life is like when you're really alive while I was psychiatrized. Hindsight is 2020. I had no idea what was in store for me year after year, what could be in store for me year after year of being on those drugs. Um, and, and that's what these past year, six years have really been, like me learning what it means to be human and to be alive. And I think um, really what one of the most important lessons for me has, has been, has been not only on learning the notion of mental illness, but also of, of mental health, um, which I actually find to be even more problematic than mental illness, because really it's the, the desperate drive for mental health, whatever that even means. I mean, in our society, we really define that as normal, you know, high functioning, happy, productive, put together, sociable. Um, it's quite a rigid box that we've constructed for ourselves. and and. Not only do I think it's illusory, but I think really it's it's a prison. And I see now how all of those years of turning my life over to the system were really because I was deeply believing in this notion of mental health as what I need to have or else I'm not good enough. I'm not put together, whatever it is. I, I bought into this narrative so deeply. And, and really unlearning that has been, for me, the most liberating aspect of these past six years, because I am far from normal. I hate the word normal. I'm gonna drop a curse word here, fuck normal. <laughs> Seriously. Like, I find that word such a prison. And it's at the heart of like all forms of oppression, <sighs> racism, sexism, like, oh, go down, at the heart of it is this idea that there's a right way to be and a wrong way to be. And if you're not in this like teeny tiny little cr narrow path of right, then something's wrong with you. And I celebrate my pain today. I am not a happy, put together, high functioning all the time, like, oh, life is great, how are you? Like, I don't want that either. I have a lot of pain. I see now that struggle I had in the mirror was was a deep spiritual crisis that I didn't have the language to make sense of then, but it was me coming face to face with what it means to be human and, and to to be in a culture that puts pressure on you as a woman, as a, you know, whatever it is. I, I Life is really hard and I, and I lost the chance to explore that and to learn what my suffering and pain meant the moment I was put in front of a mental health professional who stripped my entire humanity down to this, these labels that have no meaning. Um, and so I really celebrate my pain today. I feel a lot of it. I cry a lot. I'm overwhelmed a lot. I see a bug stepped on the sidewalk and I'm despairing at the loss of that life. Like I, I, I don't want that, that to ever go away. I celebrate it today. And to me, that's the, the work I do now is about celebrating the darkness that's in all of us celebrating the light too, but not helping people see that it's, life is not about that lightness all the time. It's about the darkness as well. And that to me is what recovery means. I've recovered my humanity and my life from the medical model. Um, I haven't recovered mental health. I've really, I've recovered myself. And I, I think I'll, I'll stop at that. because I've probably gone on more than 20 minutes. Um, yeah, and I'm eager to engage with you afterwards. And thank you for listening.